Welcome back. So we'd like to reduce both type 1 and type 2 error. That would be great. The previous figure seems to show that if we reduce type 1 error, we must automatically increase type 2 error. But we can reduce both types of error by making both curves narrower. How do we make the curves narrower? Increase the sample size. This figure has means that are just as far apart as the previous figure, but the sample sizes are larger, which means the standard deviations are smaller and the error rates are reduced. And so we end up with smaller red regions there, error regions. So our alpha region is smaller and our beta region is smaller and we are more powerful. So that is the, the trick to getting everything we want. Now, the limitation to that is sometimes resources just aren't available. You don't have the time, money, or you just can't get enough uh, responses to have a larger sample size. Okay, so here's original comparison of the errors there. You can see that alpha is somewhat bigger. Beta is much, much bigger originally. So what can go wrong? Don't interpret the p-value as the probability that the null hypothesis is true. The p-value is about data, not the hypothesis. It is the probability of observing data this unusual or more unusual, given that the null hypothesis is true, not the other way around. Don't believe too strongly in arbitrary alpha levels. It's better re to report your p-value in a confidence interval so the reader can make up his or her own decision. Don't confuse practical and statistical significance. Just because a test is statistically significant doesn't mean that it is significant in practice. And sample size can impact your decision about a null hypothesis, making you miss an important difference or find an insignificant difference. Don't forget that in spite of all your care, you might make a wrong decision. Okay, so let's look at some examples. Let's look at exercise 10 on page 500. Soon after the euro was introduced as currency in Europe, it was widely reported that someone had spun the euro 250 times and gotten heads 140 times. We wish to test the hypothesis about the fairness of spinning the coin. Okay, part A, we're going to estimate the true proportion of heads. We're going to use a 95% confidence interval and don't forget to check the conditions. Well, each result is independent of the last in spinning of fair coins. So there we've got evidence of, of independence there and whether it's heads or tails is going to be random if you wanted to um, state that but this is inherently independent if it's a fair coin so you don't have to go into um, the other conditions. A sample size is sufficiently large since there are 140 successes and 110 failures both of which are greater than 10. So here, because we, remember, this is a confidence interval, so you use what actually happened. There's no null value to consider at this point for P, for P naught. Okay, so we use our calculator and we generate the confidence interval using the methods in the previous videos, and we get 0.498 to 0.622. So we are 95% confident that the true proportion of heads is between 49.8% and 62.2%. So I have that in parentheses because we're going to want to refer back to that. Does your confidence interval provide evidence that the coin is unfair when spun? Explain. Okay, so you've got to think about well, what does it mean then for fairness, if, if our alternative is that it's unfair, what would the null of fairness look like? Well, if you have a fair coin, you would expect that 50% of the time it lands heads up and 50% of the time it lands tails up. So our null hypothesis would be that P equals 0.5. Now, if 0.5 or 50% is in our interval, then our data are consistent with that. If 0.5 is not in our interval, if the whole thing was above 0.5 or the whole thing was below 0.5 or 50%, that would be evidence that we had an unfair coin. Well, our, our um, interval goes from 0.498 to 0.622 or 49.8% to 62.2%. 50% is in there. So our, our data are consistent with fairness of the coin. So no, 
50% is within the confidence interval, so it's a plausible value for the true proportion of heads. So we're not saying that it is 50%, we're just saying that our what we got, our data, is consistent with it being 50%. What is the significance level of this test? Explain. Well, alpha is 0 0.05, so that's the significance level, and the reason for that is it's a two-tailed test based on a 95% confidence interval. Okay, so that not only gave you a chance to work with um, significant levels and to make a confidence interval, hopefully it really helps you see the relationship between confidence um, intervals and hypothesis tests. Production managers on an assembly line must monitor the output to be sure that the level of defective products remains small. They, they periodically inspect a random sample of the items produced. If they find a significant increase in the proportion of items that must be rejected, they will halt the assembly process until the problem can be identified and repaired. In this context, what is a type 1 error? Well, let's remind ourselves of what a type 1 error is. It's rejecting a true null hypothesis. So we don't know it, but the null hypothesis is really true. Well, it's helpful um, just to do a little bit of scratch work and decide, well, what would be the null hypothesis and what would be the alternative? Well, the alternative is that you have now a higher proportion of defectives than what's usual. So the null would be that it's the same as it's always been. If it's less than, that's cool too. It's just, you know, the way we write the null is that it equals the usual proportion. The alternative is that it's greater than the usual proportion. So we're going to reject a true null hypothesis. So we're going to reject the idea that the proportion now is equal to the proportion that it has always been. So a type 1 error would be, would be deciding there has been an increase in defective items, okay? The proportion has increased, that's the alternative, when in fact there has not been an increase. Okay, the truth is it's the same as it's always been, but we decide that it is bigger. So that's a type 1 error. So what would a consequence of that type 1 error be? Because sometimes they ask you about this. Well, it would be that you shut down your assembling process and you're looking for, you know, something that needs to be recalibrated. And you might not find anything. Even if you do, you have wasted time. You've kept um, production from going on um, when you could have continued to have production. So it makes your cost go up. So that's not a great thing. But let's think about type 2. Type 2 error is failing to reject a false null hypothesis. All right. So again, let's remind ourselves. So the null hypothesis is that you decide, oh, the proportion now is in the same as it's always been the usual proportion of defectives, um, I can continue production. The alternative is that you um, have a greater proportion than what is your usual proportion of defectives, and so you're going to shut down the line. All right, so we're going to fail to reject the, a false null hypothesis. So a type 2 error would be deciding there has been no increase in the number of defective products when there really has been an increase. Okay, so what is a consequence here. Well, the consequence here is that you keep producing items and really there's a greater proportion of defective items being produced than you're, you're okay with and so you're going to have a lot of unhappy customers. You're going to produce a lot of items, but they're, you're going to have too many that are faulty. What type of error would the factory owner consider more serious? And the owner would probably consider a type 2 error more serious depending on the cost of shutting a line down, generally because of warranty costs and lost customer loyalty. Defects that are caught in the factory are much cheaper to fix than defects found after items are sold. Which type of error might customers consider more serious? Certainly the type 2. Customers would consider a type 2 error more serious. Nobody wants to get a defective product. Okay, so... In the real world, these things have consequences. So if any of y'all actually go into quality management, that's something that you would do. You would be testing items and making sure that you don't have evidence that you've got an increased number of defective items or else your company's going to end up having to do a recall and it's a big old pain. All right, guys, that's it for today. Oh, almost, just kidding. We need to talk about power. I forgot about that. Power is the most important thing. We forgot about it. So what is meant by the power of the test the inspectors conduct? Remember, it is the probability. The other two aren't probabilities. 
alpha is the probability of type 1, beta is the probability of type 2, but you are asked to describe the errors themselves. Power itself is the probability of correctly rejecting the null hypothesis. So again, our null is that um, the proportion of defectives is equal to the usual proportion of the defectives, and the alternative is that the proportion of defectives is greater than the usual proportion of defectives. So power would be the probability of deciding that the alternative is, is true. So it is the probability of deciding there has been an increase in the number of defective items when this is true. So it's the probability of accepting the alternative when um, that's the correct decision to make. Just not in general, but when that is the correct decision. Okay, guys. Um, oh, my goodness. There, Here we go. I thought we were almost done, and we still have more. They are currently testing five items each hour. There's a little typo. Someone has proposed that they test ten instead. What are the advantages and disadvantages of such a change? Well, the advantage would be that there's more power. Okay, whenever you increase your sample size, you're going to increase your power. It also reduces both the probability of type 1 and type 2 error. So you could list that also. Disadvantage, there would be more work testing. You'd be having to test twice as many items. It might cost twice as much. You might actually have to have an extra person hired to do it. So it may just not be worth it. But that, that's the only disadvantage. Their test currently uses a 5% significance level. What are the advantages and disadvantages of changing to an alpha level of 1%? Well, you'd have an advantage would be a smaller probability of type 1 error. The disadvantage would be, though, that you have a greater probability of type 2 error and thus less power. So if you make your alpha smaller, it is going to decrease the probability of a type 1 error, but it pumps up the probability of a type 2 error and make sure um, tests less powerful. Suppose that as the day passes, one of the machines on the assembly line produces more and more items that are defective. How will this affect the power of the test? Well, the power of the test will increase because the effect size, remember that's the difference between the expected number of defectives and the actual number of defectives, defectives is increasing. So as it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it's easier to detect. And so it makes the, the test more powerful. Okay, guys, now we're done. Sorry about that. I got so all excited too soon. Um, anyway, we're done for the day. Um, come to class, ready to work those rounds. I'll see you today, tomorrow, whenever the next class is. Bye.